Perfect. So my number one learning from uh, working uh, with and for the best, one of the best employers and the most attractive employer in the world, definitely, was the learning that you would never hire someone you wouldn't get stuck in an airport with, right? So before we dive into all the details on how how uh, will you um, uh, become attractive to those top, top, top employers, uh, just bear in mind that the majority of the people, I would say 99% that I've met from the companies you would consider as top, top, they are really nice people. They're really interesting people. They're really interested and curious uh, by nature. Um, so uh, that being the first principle on what will make you attractive is to be a nice person, whether that's as a colleague or in your private life, in sports or whatever, that is number one uh, experience that I've had myself. One of the reasons that uh, we're doing this presentation today is that um, I think at the beginning of this year, I started building a course. I can see with the, one of the guys participating here today, uh, trying to conceptualize all of the knowledge and experience I've had from uh, various roles and also by helping and mentoring a lot of people into amazing and interesting roles such as Zoom, uh, Boost, Amazon, L'Oreal and, and so on. Um, and what I found is that that using the best tools, methodologies and being smart in the in the process of getting a job is the number one differentiator. So it's not necessarily what you've done or which school you studied at. It's actually to prepare and use the best tools in the process. It will maximize your potential. Now, obviously, if you're bottom 25 percent in your class, you know, there are some companies that won't accept you. But that's a binary thing. Right. You need to meet a third, certain threshold. But for many of these top, top employers, you can actually get very, very far by using the right tools and being smart in that process. Getting a job with a top employer is really, really uh, having a big impact on your life. I can say that myself. So not only did we have easy access to potential investors when doing a startup, uh, it's also a network that today is helping each other out when it comes to job opportunities. And as written here, when, when we're doing a little bit of research in terms of salaries from an average company and a top, top company, you know, the, the average income difference is around 203% more with a top, top company, but also uh, in, in terms of your life in general. Um, one of the very inspirational people we had at Google always said to me, he didn't get why people wouldn't travel to Dublin for a couple of years working one of the tech companies. And then they would have a couch in every single city in Europe uh, when they would be traveling around because you met uh, amazing people there. Also, I mean, for me personally, work should be fun and building my career is fun and building yours should be as well. Uh, so uh, the principle for what you see now is you should only use those tools and only use this mindset that I'll present for you today if you think it will be fun. If not, don't uh, do something else. Uh, because uh, I've just seen too many people burn out if they have been there for other reasons that they really like it. And I think you'll experience when you approach these kind of employers that you will really um, meet people that are truly passionate about what they do. And then finally, uh, I assume most of you are early in your career uh, and a good start is really key. And I can see that for myself. So uh, I, like uh, some of you might uh, now, my, I struggled getting into some of the, should we say, top employers before I got my job at Google. I ran again off when I got back to Denmark, they were the one approaching and saying, hey, do you want to come work for us? So the first couple of jobs, I would say, and I say jobs because you can always kind of redirect your career. But the first couple of jobs are important in terms of which league you can enter uh, later on in, in your career. We can look into that um, a little bit later as well. So just looking at the recruitment funnel numbers, it is extremely difficult to get into the top, top, top companies. Of course, these companies do not share openly the number of applications and number of accepted candidates. But by looking at the number of employees, number of hires, and some articles that have been shared, you can kind of guesstimate in terms of what's the chance of being hired compared to an average job. Um, so <laughs> what, what, what many uh, of you have mo mo probably al almost read uh, now, in um, already read in uh, business newspapers that is that it's easier getting into Harvard, Yale and Stanford than landing a job at top companies. So uh, the numbers that flew around when I joined Google was that um, there were 4 million um, applications that year and it wasn't really crazy. 
Um, what I also know from working with uh, recruitment uh, also at scale is that most candidates are rejected because of their CV, not because it's them or not because they're not qualified, but, but because of their CV, because the recruiter doesn't understand it or it doesn't fit into the context. And then um, finally, the biggest influence on changing the odds is preparation. Um, and that's what we are here for today. So just to give you some uh, rough estimate numbers here is that if you apply for an average job in an average company for a business graduate, a business student or a graduate entry level, uh, your chances of getting a job is eight, uh, six to eight percent and chance of getting a job in a, a top company. And I've mentioned a few here, Google, McKinsey, Goldman Sachs, just from, from different industries. Um, it, it's somewhere between 0.1 to 2 percent. So it's just much more difficult and the people you're being compared to are inevitably smarter than what you will in an average company simply because of the volume they receive while building this course i, I realized that <laughs> we're training our whole life but not for getting our dream job so if you if you think back from ever since you started with primary school you trained to perform at the exam. For those of you who've practiced sports also at, a, at an elite level, um, you uh, practice to be good at a game or at a competition or whatever. And to those of you who have learned other skills in life, such as uh, instruments or languages, you, pr you practice a lot to actually being able to perform at one point. But you never have probably never trained to get your dream job. You've just trained at school or at work, but not in terms of the disciplines that are a part of getting a job, writing a CV, going to an interview, uh, uh, filling out numerical or personality test, and so on. Um, one of the big downfalls with that is that we know from science that when uh, people, they uh, have uncertainty, where they don't know what's going to happen, it's reducing the IQ. So um, there's a very good TED talk and happy to share it afterwards where they've done some research on poverty uh, in India where they have uh, tested the farmers, sugar farmers, uh, before the harvest and after the harvest, uh, how they are performing cognitive. And what they found was that before the harvest, which is, uh, the harvest is only for two months in a year, they perform much worse than after the harvest. Meaning that if they have to, if they don't know how the harvest will be, they don't have food on the table, they perform worse. And now you're actually seeing this kind of science being applied to performance in general, meaning that you perform worse when you're not prepared and ready and know what to expect when you're walking into a recruitment process. The mindset you need is the next part of, um, of my presentation here, because it is really about the mindset. And some of the things I'm presenting here are things that I take with me to work every single day still. So again, if you can take one or two things out from today and try to apply them in your career, whether you are uh, there are a couple of years until you will get your first full-time job or you're already in your career, I will be really happy because, because then my objective for today is fulfilled to, to give you something that will change and improve your, your career. The mindset you need is a part of the presentation here to try to help you structure how you prepare to get a job at one of the com most attractive companies. And again, I uh, just want to emphasize that it's quite ironic that my Google time is uh, highlighted here as being the biggest asset for me, because if I compare to what I did at Google with at that time, we're around 35,000 employees to what I do today as a 30 year old guy having global responsibility in a huge global company. I mean, what I do today, it's much more complex. It's much more difficult. The budgets are larger. The stakeholders are more senior. Um, the responsibility is much bigger. However, uh, what makes my CV sexy is that I've been with one of these companies. Uh, and the reason for, for highlighting that is that when if you want to go into one of these companies, you need to work smart to get there, even if you're really good on top of your class already. You can use the structure and this is kind of the outlier uh, sorry the the layout of the program that that i've designed but um if you start to prepare for getting your job at uh, for getting a job at one of your dream companies you can separate it with big uh, with big advantages in these sections so first of all the game i will uh, show you a couple of things in terms of what i mean with the game and it's really about understanding the field where you're playing so uh 
what should be your focus, what matters, and finding your personal why. Then it's your application and CV, which again is the place in the recruitment process where most applicants and people are uh, uh, rejected. Then it's the interview that is still being um, acknowledged as the most important thing of any recruitment process, regardless of tests and everything else. And then it's the salary, which is, of course, is key to all of us because that's what uh, uh, usually pays for the freedom to, uh, to do stuff that we want outside of work. And then finally, it's about thinking about when you get that job, how do you make sure to keep up the pace and to use the same kind of tools and methodologies to um, get promoted or grow into a role where you think it would be more interesting and rewarding uh, for you. Again, today we will only co cover a couple of uh, topics and some of them, this one, in, for instance, might uh, result in some of you saying, hmm, I don't really know if I agree with that. But what I want you to keep in mind is that every content, and that was the reason in the beginning that I um, uh, asked you guys to mention a few of the companies that you would really like to work for, because all of this is meant for the top, top, top companies. And uh, a few of them are mentioned. I don't know about the recruitment funnels in others, but it is McKinsey, Lego, Goldman Sachs, Google, Tesla to, to, to some extent, but really the companies that are really, really difficult to get into because the, the hiring bar is so high and the volume of, of applicants is huge. The first thing that I want to highlight is uh, trying to balance and uh, for you to be conscious of whether you are active or a passive job seeker. Recruiters and HR people in general uh, tend to love the passive candidates more than the active ones. And I try to, to differentiate here saying the active candidates, they need a job. They want the job uh, where a passive candidate wants a career. So there's a larger end goal and uh, um, the job is really a desire and they're able to in the, in the recruitment process or in the dialogue with the company on the first role to kind of show that this is, a, this is a journey that I'm on. This is not a coincidence that I'm here. A good example on this could be that um, uh, I interviewed a lot of uh, candidates uh, working in the tech industry and they wanted to work for a company rather than they wanted to work with the, with the customer so that they could learn certain skills so that they could go somewhere. And another difference is the generic versus specific dialogue you will have with people. So in the top companies, they would expect you to be specific and uh, more than generic in your answers and your approach to your motivation and so on. And the last part here is that the active the job seekers are motivated. So, and I wrote, I've written here that it's almost desperate when they talk about the most motivation, whereas the passionate in the passive job seekers is, um, the passion is obvious for anyone. So if you say, I'm good at numbers, on your CV, you've clearly uh, achieved some results uh, within something with numbers, math, statistics, whatever, just as an example. This is one of the things that I really hope you will take with you. And I've brought a couple of examples. No matter which top company, and it, it's applicable to all of the companies mentioned in the uh, by you in the Slido here, all of the companies, they rely their recruitment efforts and attraction efforts on four pillars. The cultural fit, which is, do you fit into the culture? Do people want to drink a cup of coffee with you? The context, do you understand the role, the company and the context of the job? The formal requirements, which is being a bit more vague in some of these top companies, but still exists. So if you know that a consultancy company wants you to be in top 10% and you're not, you know, you can try to apply, but you might fall on that path. And then finally, how you think and act. And if we dive a bit deeper into this, I've just taken the MBB companies here, so McKinsey, BCG, and Bain, and took some screenshots from their career sites here. Uh, and uh, I've you know, erased their names so that you can't see which company is which, but basically it's the same stuff, right? I hope we can agree on that. So it's personal impact, entrepreneurial drive, inclusive leadership, and problem solving skill, skills in the first one. And then in uh, the one to the right here is problem solving skills, the ability to lead, results delivery, and passion. <laughs> so it's basically the same stuff. So whenever you interact with the company, whenever you want to go somewhere, identify the pillars in their content, in their job post, in the dialogue you're having with them, and make sure you deliver and display that you're able to live up to it on all four pillars.
here are here are examples from the uh, fan companies and we'll share the slides afterwards so you can also read it uh, there another key thing in the mindset is the ability to contextualize is key and you do that by you know doing three things as homework you conclude on your achievements you know all the great things you have achieved you know all the great things you did but where you didn't achieve the results and in next step here you know why so what have you learned from achieving those things and what have you learned from the failures you've done and then finally you use your achievements and your learnings to describe your future behavior that's what it's about that's what a, a recruitment process is about that's what being attracted to a top employer is about. It is to describe future behavior. And this can be applied across your CV, in the interview, um, and in a cover letter, and wherever you want on your LinkedIn profile. So these three things should be the key in everything you're, you're thinking about displaying to a company. And then finally, being on the recruitment side now for many years, I just want to emphasize that don't take stuff personally especially not if you're approaching the top, top companies, because a lot of people get rejected. I got rejected the first time as well. Um, your focus should be on what you have influence on. You can influence how your CV looks and what's in your application. You can prepare for your test and assessment uh, so that you feel comfortable with it. And you can also prepare for your interview and your salary negotiation. What you cannot prepare for or control is what's happening within the company. What's the timing like? How's the uh, full-time employee planning? Is there even a room for you uh, when they want to hire you? So the reason for mentioning this is because it can be a quite tough process to uh, pursue a career in one of these top companies. Um, you should focus on what you can control and also accept that sometimes there are uh, influences outside of your control circle where you can't do anything. Then I've taken just a small, small sample, four to five tools that I would love to give to you in terms of how do you approach the thing about approaching one of these companies. And when I say approach, it might not be applying for a job. Uh, it might just be finding out, you know, where do you want to go? How does your career look and what kind of companies are in the scope of your future? And um, this three layer analyzing model will help you, um, you know, Again, uh, structure and contextualize the stuff that you've done previously so that it makes sense in that specific company or that specific role. So first, look at the business. What is the, the company, sorry, here? what's the business model? What type of employees do they have? How do they appear? How are they being reviewed? All of these data points are publicly uh, accessible for everyone. And again, a good example I could give you is that we had so many motivated uh, candidates um, in, in Google back in the days, um, but many of them didn't know to a very large extent that the majority of revenue came from ads. Uh, I think it's obvious for anyone today, but this is back in 2014. Um, and um, uh, that's not good enough in a, in, a, in, a, in a job interview session or in a screening session. You want to make sure that the people working for you know exactly, uh, not exactly, but to a large extent have done some research into what's the company about. The second part here is the job. Uh, so uh, who are the peers? What, what's their background? What does the managers look like? So what's their ba background? What's the career pattern? Except from reading the job description thoroughly, of course, it's about investigating all the stakeholders around and seeing what have they done in their career? What are they highlighting? Uh, I'm pretty sure that if you took uh, 10 example CVs from people uh, at BCG or whatever, they would be quite a miracle because that's a big part of their daily job. It is to describe progress with numbers that you can extract. I might go into a role where the numerical part or the analytical part is playing a big uh, uh, role. And then finally, when you know your interviewers, um, make sure that you do your research on their you know, uh, social media profiles. So what's their background? Have they had any uh, different career path or any similarities uh, with you that you can take um, into consideration when uh, having the dialogue with them. I just heard someone unmute. So if there are any questions or any input, let me know. Otherwise, I, I will continue. As you can see or hear, <laughs> the, I've already mentioned being specific and uh, reflecting on learnings and so on. And this is a very simple example model. And this is very important because 
um, providing by providing example and examples and by preparing examples more importantly um, you will be able to describe your future behavior by saying what has happened in the past what have I learned from it what would I do different in the future so before you write anything on your CV, before you write anything in your cover letter, before you claim anything at a job interview, you go through this model. Do I have an example of what I can claim? If yes, you can proceed. Can I explain it in a way the interviewers will understand it? If it's yes, you can continue and I'll explain the models. If it's no, stop. And the reason for this is that the worst thing that can happen is that you claim something that you cannot support by a very good example and here i'm not talking about you know just saying oh i did a project at my ex company no 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 down to the lowest possible level of the decisions you had to make the stakeholders you had to communicate with the reasons you took the decisions you did what kind of results you expected uh, from it what kind of results did you get how did you analyze, analyze that and how did you use it going forward just as an example if you are yes all the way here you can use some of the models i will uh, thoroughly describe the start model in a second, but also just uh, two very simple models in everything you do in, your, in, in, in displaying yourself to top companies, the IAOA, so impact and or achievement. So if you cannot check off anything you say or write that it's an impact and or an achievement, don't write it. No one cares in the top companies, have I learned, about areas of responsibility. They care about what results have been delivered and what were you responsible for? And then the other one here is the car model. So context, action, result. What was the situation? What did you do? What was the result? We will go through a bit more detailed model in a second, but this is just good to have in mind that you need the car in everything you do. And then a model that I've heard being you know, explained to students many times, also at different universities and business schools where I've been teaching, I've seen the career center sharing, you just need to prepare for the STAR model, which is situation, task, action, and result. And it's all great. The problem is that most serious applicants, they do that when they are at a job interview. So someone would ask you, uh, Matthias, you know, give me an example of an incredibly difficult project that you have uh, solved in your current job. And then they would expect you to go to what was the situation? Um, uh, what did your what was your analysis? What, what 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 did you thought you had to do? What did you do? And what was the result? And that's all fine. I mean, I, I would expect you guys have seen that before. But where it's different in the top top companies and the top applicants, also the people that I've had the pleasure to interview, is the two last part here, which is why I call it start. And that's reflection meaning that they're not only able to complete the star model, but they also able to reflect on the choices that they've made and that they did not make at the time and what kind of impact it had, what they learned from it and how they would do it differently. So that's the reflection part. And that's where you start to stand out and where you can really nail it, whether that's in the interview process at a case uh, assessment or a, a group assessment, any, any stuff like that is when you can perspective your previous experience into a current role. So that's where you've been through the whole situation, task, action, result, and reflection. And then you say, so I can imagine in this role where my key tasks are to deliver X, Y, Z, that I could use that experience to not make the same mistake or to enhance like I did in my previous job. That is where people on the other side of the table will, you know, take on boxes and say, this person is great for the job. And I think the final thing that I want to give you is the superhero of Eric. So when I lived uh, abroad, I attended what co was called what's called Global Sales School. It's one of the um, best um, sales schools in the world. Uh, all my teachers were 60 to 65 and have been working with sales for 20, 30 years. And they all said, this is the most powerful model you'll ever uh, use. So it's a sales model that I personally always try to give to, um, to, uh, to people looking for their dream job as well, because it's very powerful if you end up in a situation being challenged or uh, having an objection. The Eric model is quite simple. So whenever you face something that is not in your favor at a job interview or in a dialogue with a, uh, with a potential uh, new company, 
you start by exploring. So what's the reason behind asking this question? Uh, why is your interview of that opinion? Then you refine the scope of the question or objection so that you have the same understanding. And I'll give you an example in a second. Then you influence the person you are talking to. And finally, you close so you can agree that, you know, you agree on something. The current job I have, which I really love, um, especially because I applied for that job because the manager in the department I'm working is a super, super cool uh, woman that I really wanted to work with. And she invited me for the last interview with one of the regional CEOs. And at the end of the interview, he said to me, David, I like you, but um, um, you, um, you will be bored here. I don't think you will enjoy it uh, as much as you think. And then instead of just saying, you know, I disagree or that's not, <laughs> that, that's not how I feel, I said, so why, why are you saying that? What do you think uh, that would be the case? Can you give me an example uh, of that? And then he said something and I said, well, I, I understand your point and I can see that when you look into my CV and hear me speaking, you see something. But actually, I also, you know, uh, have these skills and these preferences. So and then I moved over to the influence part here. Uh, I hope you would agree with me that the biggest task in this job is to deliver X, Y, Z over the upcoming years. And I'm entrepreneurial and I love building stuff. And then moving to the close phase, would you agree with me that that's the most important part of that role? And he was like, yeah, I actually see that. Uh, this is difficult because when you're in that situation, you are engaged. So uh, you not, don't necessarily have the time to reflect on it. But the Eric model will help you when you end up in a corner where you feel it's, uh, it's difficult to, uh, to get out of.